sure. All right, big crowd. We're gonna get ready. <laughs> Don't ask you, questions at once. I okay? think you should all move down this way to make <laughs> us feel a little more secure. All you eBay people, come on down. <laughs> <laughs> Naomi. So I'm gonna introduce our panel today of esteemed government relations professionals. First, to my right, we have Ashley Gould, the VP of Corporate Development and Chief Legal Officer for 23andMe. Ashley leads 23andMe's legal and government affairs team and oversees regulatory affairs, human resources, and public relations. Prior to joining 23andMe in April 2007, she was a VP Legal Affairs at Cotherix, a public biopharmaceutical company acquired by Actillion in January 2007. Before that, she was with Wilson Sonsini and O'Malveny. She received her JD from USF and her BS in political economy of natural resources from UC Berkeley. So welcome, Ashley. Thank you. Next to Ashley is Kenneth Kaufman, a partner at Manat in DC, right? Correct. So Ken's practice focuses on entertainment, media, copyright, content and music licensing, internet and social media law. He has extensive experience as both in-house and outside counsel in the entertainment and communications industries. He was previously with Skadden and was the Senior VP General Counsel of Showtime Movie Channel, Senior VP and General Counsel of Polygram Records, and GC of the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts. He also serves as a visiting lecturer at Yale, and he has served as Assistant Counsel for the U.S. Senate Judiciary Committee and as a law clerk to Judge Warren Ferguson of the U.S. District Court for the Central District of California. Ken graduated from Yale Law School and Harvard College, so we'll forgive him for that. Um, on Ken's right is Michael Callis, who's the Director of Client Development at RPX Corporation. Michael began his career as a judicial clerk for the Honorable Chief Judge Roger Bison of the U.S. District Court in the Northern District of Florida. He went into private practice with Fish and Richardson's Boston office and later was a founding member of Confluence Law Partners, focusing on the defense, development, and strategic employment of clients' IP assets. Prior to RPX, Michael litigated complex patent issues in federal courts in the ITC, negotiated technology licenses and reviews of IP portfolios of billion dollar mergers and acquisition, and advised businesses in capitalizing on their IP. Michael graduated from University of Virginia School of Law in UC Berkeley. And I am Mary Huser. I'm the VP of litigation at BlackBerry, um, formerly with the law firm of Bingham McCutcheon, and before that with eBay. And thank you for all the eBay people for being <laughs> here. Um, so with that, we will get going. Our topic broadly defined was government relations what keeps government relations people up at night. And since none of us are full-time government relations people, we're going to speculate on what keeps them up at night <laughs> and what, what keeps us telling them to stay up at night. So we've kind of got a broad set of different topics that um, different internet and e-commerce companies face um, related to government relations and legislative areas. And I'm going to start with Ashley and just have her talk a little bit about some of the things her company, 23andMe, has gotten involved in. Sure. So, so for those of you who don't know, 23andMe is a personal genetics company. I'll just really briefly, briefly describe what we do so you can understand how it has translated into government affairs work. So, um, so the company was founded in 2006 following the Human Genome Project with the idea the founders had that everybody has the right to understand what's in their genome and it should just be accessible to people, and that you should be able to, if you read about a new study, you should be able to understand what it means for you personally. So basically it's a saliva test. You go onto our website, you order, we ship you a saliva collection kit that goes to a lab that we've worked, that we contract with, they extract your DNA and run it on a <laughs> technology that's not ours, but that we've customized, and then we're really a software company, so we have a bunch of scientists, geneticists, bioinformaticists, and we take all of that data and then you log in online to a secure website where you can basically surf your genome. So it's both health and ancestry related information. So the company um, launched in late 2007 and we had, you know, we met with FDA before we launched and we had sort of ongoing meetings. We sort of in immediately had um, interesting issues to deal with starting with the state of California. Um, 
saying that we were a laboratory. And so they're all different from a government affairs perspective. You have both state and federal issues that you can come across. We've come across all of them. But probably the most notable one was in 2010, a competitor um, started up and they put out a press release saying they were going to stock their kits in um, CVS and Walgreens across the nation. And the next day, we and they and a number of other companies got letters from Congress and from FDA. And the letter from Congress literally footnoted this press release, um, which started, initiated an inquiry into the direct consumer genetic testing um, industry and, and ended up being a, um, a culminating in a hearing that I had the honor of testifying at. Um, and, and it was what we really learned from a governmental affairs perspective is that we needed a government affairs program. <laughs> so, um, so it was hugely distracting to the company. It was very expensive. In the end, actually nothing came of it. Um, and it's quite possible that had we been spending time on the Hill educating people about what we do and what we don't do, that we either wouldn't have been included in it or it wouldn't have come about. So, um, so to me, one of the big, the big hard learnings at 23andMe has been it actually pays off to invest in governmental affairs and to, and it's really a lot of relationship building, spending time with people, explaining what it is that you do, answering questions, making sure they understand so that if something comes up, you can go and talk to them about it. Um, so I would say that was sort of the biggest learning. And I really think in the Valley, people, especially startup companies, don't tend to expend resources on this because there's so much you have to figure out if the business model is going to work and this and that, and you can end up getting into um, issues that are distracting for the company. So. so what do you do now that you've learned that lesson that you need government affairs, but you're also the chief legal officer and you've got a company to build and you're doing PR, HR, and yeah. something else too. <laughs> so we hired a lobbyist. Um, which was actually a really fascinating experience for a company of many, many scientists, many of whom came from Stanford. Um, I had one scientist come up to me and say, is it a good thing or a bad thing that we're hiring a lobbyist? So there's that. People have this, or some people have this impression that lobbyists are bad, and right? Um, but what you really realize is that you just need somebody who's constantly in D.C. who can constantly be reminding people and telling people about what your business is about. So we hired a lobbyist, and then um, I go back to D.C. several times a year and do meetings on the Hill, and then I also have, whenever our scientists or other folks are going back east, I have them connect with our lobbyists and go on meetings um, on the Hill. So it's really just a continuous process um, to be trying to educate people and, and keep them remembering the company. Mm -hmm. okay. So... Ken, um, you get involved kind of in a different area of the law, and even as somebody who's been in-house and as an outside lawyer, um, doing a lot in the social media, music, entertainment area, why don't you tell us some of the GR issues that you get involved in and that both in-house and as an outside lawyer? Uh, sure. I, I am in Washington, D.C. I'm not a lobbyist, although some of my colleagues are. Uh, but I have uh, represented many clients on issues on the Hill or in the Copyright Office. Uh, I do a lot of work in the copyright area, which uh, historically, of course, has been vitally important uh, both in the entertainment and media uh, industries and increasingly these days in the technology and digital media areas as well. And I just thought I would talk a little bit about uh, what's happening in the copyright area, what the prospects are, what issues are sort of on the horizon. Uh, the last two general revisions of the Copyright Act in the U.S. were in 1909 and in 1976. And in 1976, the most recent codification, there was major consideration of various proposals for revision from the 1909 Act beginning in around 1955. So it took more than 20 years to sort of reach a consensus and get legislation actually passed. And as shortly after it was passed, the, the then head of the Copyright Office, Barbara, Barbara Ringer, called the 1976 Act a good copyright law for 1950, <laughs> uh, which was a reflection of how at any point in time the copyright law lags behind technological developments. Um, there, of course, are periodic amendments to the Copyright Act every few years. The major ones uh, were about 15 years ago, the DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, 
which actually passed within a few days of two other laws, the um, Copyright Term Extension Act, the Sonny Bono Act, which extended copyright by 20 years generally, and what was called the Fairness and Music Licensing Act. Uh, I actually was very involved in the negotiations for all three of those bills. And uh, Ashley was talking about building relationships. Uh, the way legislation gets passed, particularly in the intellectual property area, is Congress much prefers for the stakeholders in the affected industries to spend a lot of time talking to each other, negotiating with each other, and trying to work out compromises issue by issue. And that was very much the process of, with the DMCA particularly, which enacted safe harbors from liability for internet service providers and websites, uh, and uh, notice and takedown provisions for copyright owners, and a number of other things. But that was the result of a process over several years with groups of different uh, stakeholders where ultimately, essentially, a, a consensus was reached on the most contentious uh, issues. Now, just in the, uh, within the last couple of years, um, there were some proposals, uh, 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 SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, and PIPA, the equivalent in the House, uh, which uh, achieved a lot of consensus on the content side. But at a certain point in time, as you're probably aware, there were major objections raised and major internet campaigns waged uh, by technology uh, companies and uh, activists on the technology side, resulting in those bills essentially having gotten torpedoed. And just in the last couple of months, there have been proposals for taking a fresh look, stepping back at the issues that were would have been addressed by SOPA and PIPA, as well as a lot of other issues. The current Register of Copyrights, Maria Palante, made a speech about two months ago where she proposed uh, the next great Copyright Act and talked about issues that would be addressed. And Bob Goodlatte, who was the chair of the House Judiciary Committee, announced that they're going to hold some, a series of hearings on copyright issues. And some of the issues that will be addressed, um, first of all, the fallout from the DMCA, there's a number of issues that have arisen in the courts as to who has the burden of identifying supposedly infringing material that's being distributed online. Is that with the service operator or with the content provider? And this morning there was some discussion of some of the recent cases in those areas, such as Viacom versus YouTube and the VO Shelter Capital Partners uh, litigation out here. Uh, that can certainly use some clarification. Uh, also discussed this morning was the, the Aereo case. And there's a strong feeling that it would be very helpful for Congress to clarify the scope of the exclusive rights under copyright, uh, including the public performance right, where there have been different court decisions, the Aereo case in the Second Circuit, the Aereo Killer case in Federal District Court out here, which is on appeal to the Ninth Circuit, as to when something is a public performance versus a private performance, going back to the Cablevision case in the Second Circuit a few years ago. Uh, there are also issues about so-called incidental copies in terms of reproductions and distributions. Um, other issues include the public performance right in sound recordings. There was an amendment to the Copyright Act in 1995, uh, providing for that in the US for the first time, but only as to digital audio transmissions, not for terrestrial radio and TV broadcasts. Uh, Sound recordings are only protected by copyright uh, beginning in 19, for recordings going back to February 1972. There's some feeling that maybe that should come within the federal copyright system. Uh, there are issues which Pandora has raised relating to the standards that should apply for the rate setting proceedings that are held by the Copyright Royalty Board every few years for uh, online services that stream music such as Pandora. They feel that there's not a level playing field between them and more established satellite radio systems because the <clears throat> applicable provisions of the Copyright Act have different standards for determining the rates for different sorts of operators. And that issue is one that is going to be looked at by, by Congress. Um, statutory damages has been uh, an issue both in terms of the requirement to uh, register in order for a copyright owner to seek statutory damages and a feeling on the part of some in the technology community 
that statutory damages uh, should be uh, limited in some ways that they're not uh, now, as evidenced by the Tenenbaum case in the First Circuit uh, very recently. Um, as you may know, there's also a provision of the Copyright Act dealing with uh, what are called termination of transfers, where a copyright owner that created a work not as a work made for hire uh, can get the rights back after a prescribed statutory period of time. And there are issues that have arisen uh, there, particularly since there's a different set of rules applying to grants of assignments or licenses before or after the beginning of 1978. And the Copyright Office has identified some uh, issues there. Also, um, for many years, there were major formalities in US copyright law that didn't harmonize with the regime in most other countries. You had to publish a work with appropriate copyright notice. If you didn't, it would fall into the public domain in the US. You had to, you still have to register in order to have certain remedies. Um, there's actually some feeling right now, uh, some consideration of bringing back some of the formalities that were eliminated in the 1976 Act and further eliminated in the 1989 Byrne Amendments Copyright Act that amended uh, the law. Uh, but bringing back some of those formalities, particularly um, since the term of copyright was extended by the Sonny Bono Act by 20 years, <coughs> there's some feeling that uh, uh, perhaps er, there should be a registration requirement for a copyright owner to retain the rights of copyright for the last 20 years of that extension. Uh, So-called orphan works are another area which have become increasingly important uh, those are works in which the copyright owner cannot be located after a reasonably diligent search, and particularly tying in with mass digitization projects like the Google Books project, there is some feeling that there should be some legislative relief for services like Google that may want to make available works for <coughs> whom the copyright owner cannot be identified by loosening up the traditional uh, requirements. Uh, one of the things added by the DMCA was also Section 1201, which prohibits, in general, circumvention of technological protection measures adopted by copyright owners, but which also provides sort of a safety valve that every three years the Copyright Office will solicit comments and will make a ruling, ultimately, through the Librarian of Congress for classes of works that will be exempted from that. And one of the areas uh, that's been very controversial lately was whether users of mobile phones should have the right to unlock those phones and circumvent any technological protection members after the service agreements run out. Uh, that was included in the categories of exemptions for a period of, I believe, six years. But in the most recent cycle, which goes back to last October, it was not. And there have been a number of legislative proposals which I think have a better chance of passing than some of the others, uh, to allow users to uh, unlock their phones uh, after their service contracts uh, expire. Um, there has also been, for the last several years, a movement to expand the scope of compulsory licenses, what are called statutory licenses, that now exist for things like recording musical compositions after they've fir first been released, uh, for cable operators to retransmit uh, network or uh, satellite signals. Um, and there has been some feeling that it would help the burgeoning and growing and emerging digital uh, markets for content to expand some of these compulsory licenses. And that's another thing that will be looked at. Um, there is also the first use, uh, the first sale doctrine that has been in the Copyright Act for many years giving people a right to, once they have purchased a physical embodiment of a copyrighted work, like a book or a DVD, to sell it to others. The, the Supreme Court case, Kurt Sang, uh, this past term, dealt with certain issues involving a conflict between that and the importation clause of the Copyright Act. In the digital era, what does first sale mean? One of the cases, the Redigi case in New York, has addressed that. But that's another area that the feeling is it would be very helpful to uh, have some clarification. So just in, in sort of concluding, I, I think, as Ashley said, 
Um, it's very important to um, develop relationships in Washington with key people on the Hill and with the Copyright Office and in the administration to deal with these issues. Um, I think many of these issues are going to receive a fairly full hearing on the Hill in the next uh, several months. I think the chances of a major revision are probably less than they were 15 years ago in 1978 because there are that many more stakeholders that feel very strongly about these issues than there were back in 1998. Uh, but um, I think there certainly are good prospects for a slow and steady evolution of legislative proposals, some of which uh, may get uh, adopted. And I should add, in addition, that uh, the Copyright Office itself is doing its best to sort of come into the 21st century, but has been limited up to now by primarily by a lack of funding. Uh, I know Google, back in 2005, in an orphan works proceeding, commented that the database of the Copyright Office should be searchable in a much more robust manner than it had been up to now. And the, the office has been making an attempt to do that, but it's been progressing very, very slowly. So that's sort of an overview of <coughs> what's happening um, legislatively in the copyright area. Let me ask a little provocative question and yes. hopefully get a little input from others. Is, you know, in the internet space and the technology space that we're all living in, that everyone in this room is living in, where you know, 18 months is a technological lifetime and and um, the stakes are very, very high among, between the content holders, the internet providers, the, you know, different stakeholders. Um, how much does it even matter what the copyright law says? Because, you know, I can tell you the entire time that I was at eBay, the copyright law, the cases said whatever they said but, you know, when you're at war with a bunch of brand owners, you can either choose to be at war and spend hundreds of millions of dollars and be at war and knowing that the law is on your side or you can compromise because you're trying to stay in business and grow your business and innovate instead of being at war. So h how much do you think these legislative proposals for this antiquated law really matter to what, you know, in-house and outside technology professionals are doing day to day and, and how can we speed that up a little bit so it's a little more relevant to what's going on every day in the, in the real world? No, I think that's a, a very good question. Um, in the marketplace, aside from on the Hill, there has been a major progression over the last few years. Uh, when the Viacom versus YouTube case was brought, uh, the plaintiffs included large numbers of groups, such as music publishers generally, who have since settled with YouTube and have worked out relationships for large-scale licensing so that if there is uh, a video uploaded to YouTube, as there are millions every day, that includes copyrighted music, uh, there is a process for YouTube to track that and to pay royalties to songwriters and music publishers. <coughs> Um, and at the entertainment and media industry conferences that I'm involved in, you hear a lot more about new licensing models and a lot less about piracy and suing people than you did even three or four years ago. So I think that's been a major and very uh, positive development. Um, so is the private market then the way to go as opposed to trying to go through these legislative efforts and trying to tweak a law that was created years before, you know, even the internet even existed? Well, I think it's still important for the law to try to at least mirror, well, it's, it's important for the law to give some certainty to people in the private market, people who are starting new businesses, particularly involving distribution or creation of copyrighted material. Um, if, if the law provides some certain guidelines for what you can do and what you can't do, it's much easier to get financing, it's much easier to get distribution and syndication and so on than it is otherwise. And I think the fact that the law is so far behind the technology has hampered many business opportunities and financing opportunities for that reason. So. I, I think it's worth progressing on parallel tracks. Certainly the marketplace has been moving much more rapidly than the law has, 
but I still think it's important to try to raise issues and have serious consideration and try to get agreements among the affected industries, even if it's not on a grand new revision of the Copyright Act, at least on certain issues. Um, also, SOPA and PIPA were directed in part at entities outside the US that were engaging in what content owners felt was blatant piracy. And uh, I think in view of what happened there, there are some efforts maybe to scale back what that, those laws would have addressed and do sort of a follow the money approach, at least maybe to cut off relationships with US uh, financing entities or payment processors that were facilitating those sorts of activities. Well, on that issue, one of the things you see is uh, brand owners going to Florida, um, where I think, uh, is Michael, you clerk down there? That's right. And uh, getting these injunctions, which the foreign entity hasn't even a, had heard of the hearing yet, and nobody is present for the defense, they get these injunctions and they tell the likes of PayPal to shut 5,000 companies' websites down. Is, is that where you think this should be going and, and does that give anybody any concerns regarding due process? Is that addressed to me or Mike? <laughs> either one, either one. <laughs> well, I, I think if like the law- What goes on in Florida, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> if, if the law were clarified, I, I think you'd have those things <clears throat> more out in the open and you'd have uh, a more transparent process. So I think that's another reason for, for you know, trying to pursue those initiatives at the same time. Well, Ashley, what about, you know, internationally? I mean, you know, we can have whatever the law is here, but the internet, of course, is is broad-reaching. And, and do you get involved in any international policy issues? And, you know, how big a part of that is what yeah. you're doing or what you think others are doing in this area? So from a governmental affairs perspective, it's not a big part of what we're doing. Um, we're really focused on the U.S. market. and. Um, We've done and you know continue to do sort of legal analyses in the jurisdictions where we offer our um, our service, but we don't really market next to us at this point, so it's it's not nearly as big of a, an issue. Although the privacy issues, as has been discussed in other panels, are ones that we obviously track mm -hmm. um, because even data moving in and out of countries can be hugely problematic. Mm -hmm. um, but it's not a focus from a governmental affairs perspective. But if, if I can just comment on that, I think just today or yesterday, there was a new treaty adopted by WIPO, a World Intellectual Property Organization in Marrakesh, uh, relating to um, making copyrighted material available to people with print uh, disabilities uh, or who were visually impaired to um, facilitate uh, opportunities for making material available without circumventing copyright laws. Mm -hmm. This is one of the areas that uh, people in Washington, and particularly the Copyright Office, have been pursuing over the last several years. So the U.S. was very actively involved at the diplomatic level in pushing for adoption uh, of that treaty, which I believe, as I say, just passed today and goes into effect uh, after 20 countries uh, ratify it. The DMCA in 1998, in part, was passed as a response uh, as well as the Copyright Term Extension Act as a response to a WIPO treaty that had been adopted shortly before then. Mm -hmm. So what about you know, marrying some of the foreign policy issues with some of the domestic policy issues in the copyright area? As you know, throughout Europe, you have different countries having different policies on everything from first sale to parallel imports to um, just standard copyright issues, and you've got the importation issues that came up in the Kurt Sang case. Um, how important is it for stakeholders to be looking globally when they're in Washington lobbying on these issues as opposed to just looking nationally? Well, certainly if you're a, con if you're a company that is in business globally, it's important to keep an eye on things globally and not just in the U.S. Um, having said that, I think the U.S. has the maybe the mo most robust copyright system in, in, in one respect, which is because of the registration system here and the recordation process, which enables you to record 
documents pertaining to copyright ownership, even if you're not the copyright owner, that the US copyright system tends to be very <coughs> central to anyone even internationally who is doing uh, transactions involving copyrighted material. We represent, for example, a number of international media companies that have been doing acquisitions of other international media companies. And as part of the diligence process, uh, often uh, reviewing the records in the US Copyright Office is very important uh, since they tend to reflect not only US but often um, uh, foreign uh, works uh, that are distributed in the US or published in the US. Uh, so I think the short answer is um, they're both important. Can I ask one question? Yeah. yeah. Of course. So what do you think the likelihood is that we'll get to a revision anytime in our life anytime <laughs> soon? <laughs> because one of the things that we talk a lot about is yeah. that just the state of Congress and yeah. one you have all these stakeholders who have issues, uh, but just Congress itself getting things done right now is. Well, Congress is very gridlocked, uh, as you know, with Republicans controlling the House and uh, Democrats controlling the Senate and having a 60 vote cloture rule in the Senate, which was actually adopted during the time I, I worked there for Senate Judiciary Committee. Uh, so I think that you're right. There are, I mean, President Obama this week issued executive orders on climate change because the administration concluded that there was simply no prospect for any meaningful legislation getting through Congress. Um, historically, copyright issues have, until maybe five, 10 years ago, have been bipartisan. I think they're still bipartisan, actually, but have, have, have not been particularly contentious. It's been a question of getting industry stakeholders together. They have often been contentious between the owner side and the user side, but not between the Democratic side and the Republican side. I think that's still true to some degree, and I don't think the partisan gridlock in Congress by itself would operate to delay consideration of a major revision. But I think the major other change from 15 years ago, as I mentioned earlier, is the stakeholders have become much more numerous and much more um, important the people who need to be at the table. Uh, in 1998, uh, the iPod hadn't been invented, the iTunes Music Store hadn't been invented, the Google Book Project hadn't been launched. Um, every technology company represented at this Congress either didn't exist or was in a much earlier stage of its evolution. Um, and I think for that reason, it's going to be much more difficult to work out what I think are gonna be necessary compromises among the stakeholders in order for legislation to be passed. So the short answer to your question is, I certainly don't think it's very likely in this Congress or even in the next Congress. Uh, I think what is much more likely are s small incremental pieces of legislation. I think that um, I wouldn't rule out the possibility of a major revision, um, but I think it's gonna take longer than the next uh, year or the next uh, three years. So, you know, one area where we actually have had some miraculous <coughs> movement of late in Congress has been in the patent reform area with six pending bills in different areas of Congress, the White House coming out with some executive orders, and perhaps maybe we'll get some movement on a, a really tough area, which is, you know, non-practicing entities going after technology companies and, you know, again, starting yet another war um, where people are focusing on litigation instead of innovation, which is very damaging ultimately. And so, Michael, do you want to talk a little bit about what's been going on there? Because I think we have seen, in, in my mind, a stunning amount of, of energy being put into this and hopefully we'll get some kind of resolution. Yeah, and I, I think we'll get some resolution. The question is, I think, going to be one of impact. Um, so I, I work with RPX Corporation. If you're not familiar with us, I guess in a sentence, what we try to do is both prevent NPE cases um, and reduce the costs associated with them. As a result, you know, we, we track anything affecting what we think of as the patent market, which will be anything from funding and sales sides, also um, regulations 
uh, patent laws, uh, changes in case law, and uh, legislative patent reform. And this is something we'd had our eyes on for a while. Um, but only recently we realized that while it affected all of our clients and prospective clients, there was a great disparity in terms of access. Some of the larger companies had um, sophisticated lobbying efforts, were very involved in what was out there, and some of the smaller companies, and many of the retailers, um, it, it was new. It was new, uh, just as the NP problem was a bit new. Um, and in fact, it was, it was the Asian companies who um, were so greatly impacted and just had no idea what was going on in Washington. Who, who gave us the idea that wouldn't it be useful if somebody um, comprehensively tracked every known reform effort um, and, and, and by doing so, giving companies the opportunity to cooperate, to prioritize, to work, to work together. So um, RPX as a company, uh, we are sort of neutral market participant. We, we neither want you know, the abolition of patent rights nor the other way. Um, but on the other hand, we do believe that everybody is benefited by um, a, a more transparent patent system. So we do, in addition to the tracking, we recently um, held a uh, patent reform working session. And surprisingly, it was packed. Um, surprisingly, we had, I think, maybe 50 companies, 40, uh, 50 people, 40 companies who came to attend. And I say that that's surprising just because if we had had that same, you know, working session a year earlier, probably would have been me talking to myself. Um, there just wasn't a lot of interest in the wake of AA. Well, <laughs> Mar Mary and I, again, you'd have your panelists. Um, so, uh, you know, in the wake of the AA, I think a lot of companies were sort of playing wait and see. They wanted to see if, in fact, the joinder provision would have a massive impact. Um, and initially, it did, uh, it appeared to. Over the last, uh, over the six months subsequent to the AIA, there was a, a noted lull, and many of you maybe noticed it in the amount of patent troll litigation that was getting filed. Regrettably, that was just the effect of like compressing all of those lawsuits just prior to uh, the AIA's passage. And sure enough, over the, the, the subsequent year, the rates of NP litigation both returned and exceeded their previous rates. As a result, not surprisingly, interest in doing something about that has returned and, in fact, increased. Um, so I, I have a, you know, I, I keep a, a spreadsheet um, of the known efforts, and there are a lot of them, and I'm not going to go through all of them today. Um, and in fact, I understand patent reform is maybe a late ad in terms of a subject, so I'll go by the number of people checking their phones on, on how on topic and interesting I am. <laughs> but, you um, should not assume that you're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ashley. You're looking up their patents. <laughs> I'm certain that's it. They're, just, they're getting up to date. But um, I think this is going to be a useful <laughs> format. Um, I, I present on this topic a, a fair amount, you know, and anytime you have a, a database or a number of ways you can slice and dice it. And the way that I usually present it is, um, you know, uh, legislative efforts, administrative executive efforts, judicial efforts, and, and market-based efforts. I, I, I've got a change of heart. I think the way to do this is say, what's broken in the patent system? And track the efforts according to those. Um, so here's my one man's uh, perspective on what's broken. One, we have poor quality patents. I think everybody can attest, especially if you're getting hit by software patents, that a lot of the stuff that's coming through gives you gives you know the real head scratchers. How on earth did this ever get issued? Um, the the other problem would be notice. Let's say you want to be a good citizen and you want to avoid patents or take licenses to them. Um, it's, it's virtually impossible, especially in the software space. Now, if you're in pharma, different story. But in the software space, virtually impossible to search the USPTO and understand where the landmines are. Um, and then th the next problem is litigation. Um, litigation is an attempt to value a patent. That's all it is. It's all it is. Um, it's just a horrifically inefficient and expensive way to get about doing that. And the final one is a lack of information. So if we can agree that those four categories are kind of what's broken in the system, I, I want to review some of the recent efforts, kind of put them in there. Um, first, I'm going to, well, I'll just jumble them in together. I'm going to talk about actual government efforts, either bills that are uh, in process or some of the executive orders or legislative recommendations that President Obama just made. And then I'll also um, take from our last working session um, some of the industry's interests in, in patent reform and uh, where people might want them to go. Um, I'll also, because I've got a live microphone, interject you know, what I think is the likely impact on any of these. Um, and at that point, I'll try to put a pause in there. If you want to pitch in your own, um, your own opinion on that, I'd be glad to hear it. So um, let's start first with the quality 
uh, question. What are, what are we, what's in the works right now that is aimed at increasing the quality of patents? Um, there is, in this recent spate of um, orders and, and recommendations for Congress, uh, a uh, directive to improve function claiming. Um, this is actually aimed at, at educating the agents who deal with, with functional claiming, means plus function, and if that's a little bit outside for you, it would be the ability to describe an invention as, well, you know, it's the ability to sell online as, you know, a, as embodied in such and such. Um, or, or, uh, or, or I guess the other way around is a better way to describe it. Um, it, it tends to be very broad. There's lots of implementations. I don't know if it's all that effective, but it is, it is in fact going through. The problem is this doesn't reduce the number of patents that are being asserted, and it doesn't have any impact on the amount of litigation that's actually going to be filed on, on the outside. So, well, so that's, the, that's the, the question. Are we focusing on the right things in our lobbying efforts? Because if we're focusing on an individual patent's language, perhaps we're losing sight of the fact that virtually any company worth its salt has thousands of patents and when they want to assert them against their competitors or better yet so that they can't be sued back put them into a non-practicing entity and then assert them against their competitors often joined together with um, two competitors against the others in their industry um, What's the difference when one patent's language is when you're dealing with, I've got 10,000 patents and you need to take a license for $100 million and otherwise we'll sue you on two at a time. That's right. So how do we focus more on that big picture on the, on the you know, not getting 10,000 patents in the first place? Yeah, um, I don't see anything in the current shoot that's really going to change that. Um, I, I think we've got this this function uh, bit, and then you've got also the extension of uh, you know the increased review for business method to cover all of software. Firstly, I, first, I don't think either one really gets any traction. You got to remember that um, you know Microsoft, Google, SAP, they make their money on software patents, and I cannot imagine that they want a regime that's going to make that more expensive and more difficult for them to get those rights issued. So, do they ever get passed? I I got to say I doubt it. Um, Microsoft has a lot more lobbying money than, than, than the people who are, you know, <laughs> Well, the down. problem is people are on both sides. Yeah. Because everyone that has patents, they want to have broad, and everyone gets sued on patents, they want to have narrow. So thus, there is no one on the functional claiming side other than some lawyers. That's it. And, and yeah, and, and we lawyers tend to do well on those things. So um, the other side is notice. Um, I'm just trying to be controversial. <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll keep it going. Um, notice, and there are a couple of provisions I want to discuss. The litigation side, interestingly, is where there are the fewest existing efforts in place, and yet I think is our greatest chance for impact. Let me run quickly through notice just to get everybody. One is there's a recommendation to create an assertion letter database, which, um, great, you know, RPX already does this. We find it very effective, but also does not necessarily stop. Uh, the amount of litigation, and then you create some willfulness problems for people. You know, the CEA say that you have to go and check the database and see if there's anything active in your area, and if so, what do you need to do about it? Do you now need to affirmatively reach out? Lots of lawyer questions. I can imagine billable hours go up. Um, impact remains flat. So um, you've also got the real party and interest. I think this is necessary, and it's useful to know who is suing you, but they're still suing you, and you could always get there in discovery anyway. You were going to find out very quickly. Uh, who is behind it? Um, so, again, actually, that's an area that I I think I you know kind of beg to differ on that one, where it really is fundamental, and I think that's what is getting some traction in Washington is that the real party in interest is never some small little entity that's just suing you on two patents and happens to hold a portfolio. Generally, it remains controlled by some other big company out there, all of whom, all the inside IP people are told, monetize your IP, monetize your IP, monetize your IP. They stick it over here in a small little company. They sue someone else. There's all sorts of anti-competitive problems with that. There's all sorts of issues. So knowing who is suing you, truly who is suing you, yeah, I think it. is really starting to gain some traction in Washington and with the courts, once the courts, once you start really focusing on that in court and the court starts figuring out, oh, 
this is really your competitor who is suing you, who wants you out of that area of the market. And once juries start hearing that, then it's very compelling. And the problem is you can get it sometimes in discovery, although these entities are very, very carefully crafted by very skilled lawyers, are often offshore. It's extraordinarily expensive to do. But when you do do it, it's very compelling. And I think what we're seeing in Congress is Congress saying this shouldn't have to cost everyone millions of dollars in discovery to get to the question of who is suing you and what are they after, really. And so I think that is one legislative proposal. Maybe I'm just optimistic about it because I think it would be so valuable. But I think that really is starting to get the eye and ear of people in Congress that yeah. sounds pretty basic. Why, why shouldn't you know who is suing this you? Is, th- so this is one that was actually very interesting to a lot of, both on the administrative side and on the legislative side in the working sessions that we held recently. And a lot of people focused on the RPI, the real party in interest. Um, I guess I, I personally have some practical questions about it. I mean, let's say you want to find out if a competitor is suing you. Most of the time, they don't retain a back end. They sell it outright to an NPE, and NPEs are in the business of suing people. They know exactly what they will do. I mean, I can name a lar- large number of companies that you know we all view as being very white hat who do that on a routine basis, buy up a patent portfolio, take a license to it, and then just drop it off with the you know NPE with the biggest teeth, knowing that they will sue not just one competitor, but all of their competitors. And so long as it's a clean sale, I don't think it shows up in the RPI. Plus, what do we do? Do we, it, it, it's un- it's not a cl- it's not a clean sale. If the they back keep a back end, end. The back end yeah. is virtually always there. And, and now- that, I think, is the key to this issue, is that that's fine. If a company wants to take its most valuable assets, are we to really believe this? technology company has spent all this time and energy to get 10,000 patents. They want to often give them for free to this non-practicing entity with a clean sale, and they want nothing in return, no returns on that, no money on that. I mean, you question what their shareholders would think of them giving away their most valuable assets, but it often is the case, in fact, most often, that, in fact, that money is coming back 80, 90, 100% right back to them after costs deducted for the litigation. So I think having the real party and interest identify, which includes not just a who's this company, let's look in some database and see what the non-practicing entity's name is and that whether they're affiliated with, you know, Acacia and have spun off 16 times, is who, where is the money going? Talk about follow the money, as we talked about earlier. Where is the money going in the end? Because it is... It is virtually impossible to believe, and in fact, you know, unlikely, that companies are just transferring their assets to these companies for nothing and never getting anything in return. Yeah, but, but we, we I, I agree, and, I, and I'm glad to see it move, but you also see a lot of clean sales. I mean, this is, this is retail, right, online retail. So I presume most of you have a leverage from Kronos. Um, and that was a UBS portfolio that they got from High Point Technology. They sold it outright. Still a problem. Wouldn't show up in the RPI, I don't think, at this point. You know, I think a lot of the stuff that's out there, it, it'll, it'll have an impact, and it is uh, definitely going to make things cheaper. I think what it might do, ultimately, is focus the public's awareness on the fact that there are a handful of organizations, even NPEs, who are sourcing a lot of this. Um, historically, intellectual ventures, if you're familiar with them, they play shell games and moving around all their assets. So you're probably getting sued right now if you have a letter from Lotus, for instance. You're probably getting sued by intellectual ventures. You just don't know it. You're getting sued by um, intellectual ventures unless you go and you look and you're like, oh, Bellevue address, that's awfully strange. And you still probably can't prove it, but um, but they're back there. An RPI, something like that, you might, you might finally get some clear evidence on the amount of litigation that's being controlled by Acacia and IPNAB. And, and, and IV and mostly in Wildland and the other bigger players. And, and at that point, maybe, maybe, maybe then Congress realizes that this is a business a little bit more, and, and maybe we see something in the future. I, I think that that could be an additional benefit of it. Well, and I think if you expose on the front end how much these entities are front-ending their um, licensing strategies with the technology companies, you know, a lot of companies just mm-hmm. take the IV portfolio and buy their share of it, and um, mm-hmm. it's a great, great percentage of what 
technology companies are spending on IP, and is that the way to go, or should we actually be focused on innovation and development? And I think as these things come out, um, it's almost a common sense argument of you've got to be kidding that you know hundreds of millions of dollars are going out the door um, right. on these you know kind of frivolous patents in many ways. I don't feel strongly about that. No. <laughs> Um, two more that came up that, that, that there are no current efforts in the works, but um, this organization, again, we, we asked people to focus on impact, and it was agreed that there are two other notice type provisions that would have tremendous impact. One would be a heightened pleading standard, so requiring in patent infringement cases that you do more than just say, you know, you, you name a company or their search functionality and explain that that, that, that somehow um, impacts your patent rights. Um, I think that that could have. The other one was a market-based uh, solution, which is um, Cisco and RPX both have um, programs now um, trying to get people voluntarily to give uh, notice to the market of the intent to sell, specifically the intent to sell to an NPE. Um, that should uh, allow other operating companies to step forward. And that should, um, of, of course, bring you know shine more light on the dynamics of these patents moving around. Um, so on the uh, specificity point, you know, I was at an industry uh, conference on all of these legislative proposals, and a lot of people talked about the impact, you know, it used to be in the 90s, the technology companies would be sitting at meetings like this and talking about the, um, the securities litigation that would be filed every time a company's stock dropped, they would get sued for security fraud. There was no way to get out of those cases. Companies were sell settling for millions of dollars. Everybody had them. Everybody had 10 or 12 of them. And we had to do something about it. In 1995, Congress passed the uh, Private Securities Litigation Reform Act, which re simply required a heightened pleading standard that you've got to state with specificity why you think there was wrongdoing. And guess what happened? The private securities litigation dropped like a stone because there wasn't anything to say. So, you know, these heightened pleading um, requirements for patent litigation could very well have the same impact on the technology industry that the PSLRA had 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um this is one, of course, my little pitch is if this is particularly interesting to you and your company and you want to be connected with the people who are driving these efforts, that's what we do. We just make the introductions, but um, hopefully put everybody on the same page and speaking with one voice on that. Um, I mean, I'm going to do reverse order here. The next one, because uh, I want to finish with where I think the greatest impact can be found. So the next one is information sharing. There are a couple of... Uh, executive orders and legislative recommendations around this, and then I think we might have followed the FTC's um, announcement yesterday, two days ago now, I think. Um, first of all, in the executive order, there is a, um, uh, there, are, there are a couple attempts to uh, create resources for people who are getting sued, um, explaining what their options are, what some strategic position could be. I, I, it's, it's actually rather unclear what sort of information, that, that can't possibly be a bad thing. Um, there are, uh, you know, you take a campaign like Innovatio, and you've got a lot of companies getting sued who have sort of net revenues under a million a year. They don't have the, the resources to go out there and start from scratch and figure out how to respond. That, that, that I think is going to be a very useful thing. Um, expanding research. Um, obviously, you know, I believe the idea there is to collect data. Um, RPX has contributed to the executive branch a number of times data on, on, on a couple different points. It's in fact what we think is one of our better functions. We've done a comprehensive cost study, which is collected, and I believe eBay is a participant, so thank you for that. Um, uh, it, but the idea not is, me no, no, not you anymore, but I understand a lot of colleagues out here in the room. Um, and uh, more information is better. Uh, it, it is from uh, our cost study that the first numbers, uh, you know, actual dollar value numbers on what this is costing um, operating companies were derived. Um, and, and I think that we can, we, can, we can say that that really caught the attention of Congress. We know because that those studies are getting cited over and over and over. Um, and just so long as we know what the actual 
fiscal impact is to the uh, to the country and internationally of MP actions, I think that that's going to be very helpful. The FTC announced that it will be using it, its its subpoena powers. Um, uh, I think they have nine subpoenas that they can issue. Um, they haven't yet announced who will be subpoenaed and for what records. Um, but that could be very interesting. After that, they need to go to Congress to get more. So I think stay tuned there. But the FTC, after holding its PAE workshop in Washington um, just around the new year, um, they're rolling up their sleeves and getting very involved in this. So I, I want to finish here with where I think the greatest impact can be found. Regrettably, it is where the fewest um, bills and, uh, and orders are, are currently existing. Um, this requires you all to get involved because um, I, I think a lot of change can be made. And that's in the cost of litigation. I think the only thing that's currently on the table is, a, is increasing the discretion of judges to give, uh, to give exceptional damage awards and attorney's fees under Section 285. Um, great start can't possibly hurt. Trouble is most cases don't get that far. What 2% of IP of patent litigation goes to trial, I think with NPEs, it's actually 10%, so it's slightly more. But it, it's very few, and when they do go to trial, when they do go that far, they don't tend to be the egregiously nuisance cases. So not sure of the total impact, but, yeah, I, I, but I think, and the working session agreed that the idea of sanctions um, is the right way to go. Obviously, the SHIELD Act is out there for those of you who are familiar. Um, it's sort of uh, uh, a loser pays, but only when the loser is an NPE uh, bill. Um, I, it doesn't sound like the, the Judicial Committee was particularly um, fond of it, and I can't imagine it getting broad support just by singling out an, an individual uh, type of uh, litigant. But uh, Conduct-based sanctions, increasing Rule 11 requirements and sanctions, these things uh, could be very interesting and very effective. Um, changes in procedure. Um, anytime you can front load the information, uh, the signaling sort of function of litigation to the beginning of the case, you are going to encourage early settlement, dismissal, um, uh, however you're going to get out of the case. A couple of the ideas were Venue should be something that is decided prior to discovery. Um, Markman should be pushed up towards the beginning of the uh, litigation phases, uh, along with damages. If you can do a damage hearing at the beginning of a case, decide how much is at risk. Um, it may not be necessary to go through with the rest of the trial. I think these are all stunning ideas. There are companies who are pushing these through right now who are trying to get this into a bill form. The other thing that RPX does, which may be very useful, is we track, we're trying to track, I'm trying to track, and frankly, it's kind of hard to keep up with it, but opportunities for, for amicus briefing. So trying to identify when an issue is going up to the FTC, excuse me, the CFC, and then alerting people to that. Um, the briefs from retailers count two times for every brief from an operating company to the CFC, because, uh, excuse me, an operating company, a tech company, a traditional tech company. Um, you know, when you, when you have a giant like Microsoft or Google, it's sort of assumed that they're, that they're, they're big boys in this space, they know what they're doing, and that they give and they get on the side of the patent equation. But when retailers do it, and, and not putting the focus on case law, but on facts, on, on how it has affected you, it, it gets the attention of the judges. We had Chief Judge Rader uh, at our last conference, and, and he said exactly the same thing. He said, when I see Emicus briefing from industry or industry groups, he said, I don't want to see the law section. What I want to see is the facts section. How is this impacting you? So. Um, so we've got that. There are a number of things in the ITC. I'm, I, I'm not going to focus on those because it's the ITC and doesn't really affect retailers very heavily, if at all. Um, and, and then finally, the, the, the last two are both industry efforts, market-based efforts. One is, and I think we're seeing now a proliferation of attempts on like non-assertion pledges within a company. I know Twitter uh, got a lot of press for theirs. Um, there are limits there that maybe, you know, defang it to a certain attempt. But a lot of companies are interested in this, to the point where there are a couple of programs now that are trying to get startups to commit to the idea that if their assets, it would be an encumbrance that would travel with the patent, but if indeed the patent was ever sold to an NPE, there'd be a springing license to uh, an industry group. You know, we're trying to obviously make that be RPX so any of our clients would get an immediate license to it. I, I suppose you could probably do it through RELA or NRF or something like that, but you'd be interested in that. It, it's something like 20% of NPE litigations, the patents come from a startup. 
And yet when you talk to the founders of startups, that's not their intention. They were trying to attract venture capital. They didn't get any of that back end because they're long gone by the time the company dissolves and they're selling off patent assets. And far more importantly, they see far more value in attracting um, software engineers um, uh, to their company who uh, are very sensitive to seeing their work later becoming an offensive weapon. So by, by promising that their hard work and that those patents will go to uh, it, you know, improve and support the company but never to be used as a weapon in the hands of a patent troll is very, very attractive, actually. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's what I've got. Are there any questions? Well, we've got a couple minutes if anybody has any questions. Happy to take them or you can come up afterwards and I am reminded to remind the participants to fill out their program evaluations and uh, thank you for coming. Not brought by, but are using patents that were prosecuted by startups. Okay. Startup patents. <laughs> That's correct, yeah. Occasionally you see a startup go troll, you know? Vernetics um, is one, Blingo is another. Um, and that's becoming much more attractive. What we have seen, and like this is just conversation with investors. Investors are actually looking for small failing companies right now because it avoids the MPE question in any of this litigation that's meant to trap NPEs. It plays better to a jury. It's a small investment for them and it becomes a vehicle for uh, patent troll work. I think this is the future for well-heeled NPEs on how they will uh, go about their businesses acquiring, you know, and if they can, publicly traded companies because you can then raise a lot of capital um, in, the, uh, in the public markets and buy more patents and, and, and all the rest of that. It doesn't even matter if they lose litigation at that point. They just need to have something going for investors. All right, so any other questions, just come on up. Thanks for coming and enjoy the rest of the program. <laughs>